All right, uh, welcome to CS 4510. This is the fourth lecture, first half. Uh, today's topic is uh, mostly new. Leon, uh, what's, uh, what's called context free uh, grammars. So uh, last time we mostly concluded our, our unit on the regular languages. We talked about DFAs, NFAs, regular expressions, and pumping lemma. And we talked about some closure properties of the regular languages. Today we're talking about an entirely new class of languages. And uh, then in the second half we'll compare them uh, to the regular languages and, and talk about their closure. So before I give you uh, like what is a context-free grammar, I'm just going to give you the definition of one. So a context-free grammar is uh, it's a, a tuple of uh, B, sigma, P, and S, uh, where B is the set of uh, set of what we call non-terminals or variables. Uh, sigma is just a finite alphabet. Uh, P is a set of productions. Or rules. And all a production is, is a uh, set of substring replacement rules. So you go from a non-terminal to a string of terminals and non-terminals. So sometimes the alphabet is called non-terminals. This is more of a, like a linguistics uh, denomination of these things. And then S is just a designated, designated a start uh, non-terminal. So a Grammar is just a set of substring replacements. And of course, this the definition doesn't make any sense yet. It's going to make a lot of sense when we start doing examples. You basically use the set of productions as a set of substring replacement rules. And then we say that a non-terminal, excuse me, that a grammar produces a string if after a sequence of these productions, you end up with a string with no more non-terminals in it. If, it. if it only has terminals, uh, excuse me, not non-terminals. It only has, if it only has terminals in it, uh, then, it's then it's produced that string, and then you stop. So um, like the DFA and the NFA, when you give, when, for DFA and NFA, when you just give the actual graph, the, uh, that's sufficient to give all the parts. You don't have to actually write it out, like the transition function and all that. Similar for here, if, you actually, if I ask you to write out a grammar, just giving the grammar and, and it implicitly gives all the parts. So just this, let's just do some examples. So what if, what is like um, S uh, goes to let's say A S, or I'll do it this way first, and then S uh, goes to epsilon. So this is a set of productions. What that means is it's a set of substring replacement rules. So what we do is we start with the start vari variable, and then we apply the set of productions to produce a string. So what we're going to do is to produce a string, we're going to do s, and then we're going to do an arrow. We apply the substring replacement rules. And notice that there's only one. Uh, we use capitals, by the way, for uh, variables, and we use lowercase for the terminals. So letters are going to be lowercase, like strings, letters. But variables, objects, are going to be uppercase. So we start with the start non-terminal. And we apply a sequence of substring replacements. So here we have two choices in our set of productions here of what we can do for a substring replacement. Here the substring is length one, so it's just going to be the whole string replacement. We're going to replace S by the substring, let's say AS. Now we can apply another production. We're going to choose, let's say we chose the same production. We're going to replace this string S by the string AS. So what's that going to give us? That's going to give us the production 
A A S. You guys see what I'm doing here? I can apply it a third time, and I'll get A A A S. Basically, yes, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very recursive structure, inherently recursive, right? Specifically, this one is recursive because the same symbol is on the left and the right side, right? You take the left side and you replace it with the right. You go through the, the, a sequence of, these are called working strings, and you only stop when there's no more non-terminals. So I'm going to do one more replacement. Here, we've chosen the first rule every time. Let's just choose the second rule, okay? I'm going to replace the non-terminal S by... The empty string. So that's going to give me uh, a, 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 a. So we see that a, a, a is a string produced by this grammar. So this grammar produces the string a, a, a. Make sense? So now consider, as the next jump, consider all possible strings that this grammar can produce. Let's call this grammar G. What would you say that LG is? It's just like a, just like all strings. A star, I guess. I yes. Don't, I don't. So you consider uh, all possible strings this grammar can produce. It can only produce strings that have an A in them, and it can only produce and it can produce strings of any length with an A, including the empty string. Just choose the your first rule application should be uh, this one. Is a grammar deterministic or non-deterministic? Here's a jump, a, a, a jump question. So how many, um, what, what's the term for like S to AS called? That is a production or That's a rule, a yes. How many Productions are you allowed to have? Finitely many. Finitely many. But as many as you want. Is this the same power as like a DFA or NFA? We'll talk about that at the second half. First, let's just study the object, and then we'll compare it to the regular languages. So to the original question, actually, the reason I asked this question is because it is surprising. The, this is what's called context-free grammar. The context-free grammars are non-deterministic. The reason is, is because at any point here, like as, as, you, as in a DFA, you had a choice of two states when you see an A. I mean, this was, was a sort of like a, the bare non-deterministic action. Here, you have, a you have a choice to go up or lower. Here, you have a choice of which production you want to choose. You can choose to either add more S's and, or you can choose to end your computation. So for here... Uh, the non-determinism is the fact that you have a choice of which productions you want, and the ch exact choice of productions determines the string that you produce. So already a grammar is already very, very different than an automata, right? An automata, at least the, the ones we've seen so far, uh, takes as input a string and uh, says... A yes or no. So remember, the DFA takes as input. A DFA is more like a program than a grammar is. A DFA takes as input a string and outputs a Boolean, depending on if the states are accepting or rejecting. The DFA says yes or no. The grammar doesn't take on input anything. The grammar uh, uh, correctly... Produces only the right strings. So a grammar doesn't take on input anything. Just through its sequence of non-deterministic choices, it's able to produce only the rec correct strings. Yes? Is this more like a search problem instead of a decision problem? That is a deterministic coping method. There is no searching anything. The magic is that it just does, the, does it somehow. There's no searching. So I guess if you're asking, does a grammar produce a specific string, we'll have to give an algorithm for that. It's not obvious if I give you a string and a specific grammar, can that grammar even 
produce, does that grammar produce that specific string? That's actually a non-trivial problem. We'll have to talk about it. To, to determine if a DFA accepts a string, easy. Run the DFA on the string. How do you determine if a grammar accepts a specific string? Maybe it'll, uh, that question might seem um, more, the difficulty of that question might seem more informative as I give you some more complicated grammars. So let me just give you another one. Um, Here's one uh, that should surprise you. S goes to A, S, B. And instead of, when we have the same rule on the right-hand side many times, we can just OR them together just for a shorthand. So what we do is we write the bar here, and then we write epsilon. This is just shorthand for the, the this is, these are two distinct productions. A goes to A, S, B, or A goes to epsilon. Those are two distinct productions, but we shorten it this way. It's a shorthand. So let's try and see what language does this grammar produce, right? So you're gonna let's do a C, let's just do some strings. We're gonna go s. We're going to produce. Uh, we're gonna replace s by the substring. Uh, the non-deterministically, we we can choose one of a s b or we can choose the empty string. Just to make things interesting, let's choose this one. So we're gonna get a s b. Uh, now you have to finish, you have to keep applying productions until your string has no more non-terminals. So you have to apply another production. We're going to replace this S with uh, some rule of it, some application. Well, the only two rules are ASB or the empty string. So this is going to give us a ASBB. Right? We apply it another time. We're going to get A, 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 S, B, 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 right? Then finally, let's say we got bored and we decided to terminate. We're going to apply our epsilon rule. So that's an example of one string produced by this grammar. All right, you see how during each application we just took the substrings Right, so this S became there, but here the A and the B from the previous application remain. Here we replace the, the, the non-terminal S by the substring uh, for the production of that non-terminal. So in this case, it's ASB. So here we, we, uh, we repeat that several times to produce AAABBB. So what would you guess that the language of this grammar is? This is the non a, B star. Ah, it's actually more restricted than A, B star. Be right, so, so like, um, A, B star, A, like, if you're saying A star, uh, B star, uh, this accepts any number of A's and any number of B's. However, here, notice that the rules force, every time you add an A, you have to add a B. You cannot add an A without adding a B for free. You are forced to add, one is forcing the other basically, right? So it's not just, it's actually a restriction of A star, B star. It's going to be uh, A to the N, B to the N. That the exact number of A's, the exact number of A's equals the number of B's. So this is not a question mark. This is going to be A to the N, a B to the N, a N is a natural number. But if you recall, this was the, one of the canonical non-regular languages that we pumped. We proved using the pumping lemma that this language was not regular. So here we have something immediate, that the context-free grammars, the, as the power of this device appears to be greater than the regular languages. We'll have to prove that, but we were able to prove that A star, A star is regular. That's quite literally a rejects. That's the proof that that's regular. A to the N, B to the N is not regular. However, the grammar is able to produce A to the N, B to the N. So somehow we think that the context-free grammars will prove it today, but the context-free grammars appear to be at least very different than uh, the regular languages. The, of the kinds of automata we've given, we gave uh, DFAs, NFAs, and regular expressions, and then we could only conclude that those were all equal. Here, we have an example of something immediately that it's different, right? Okay.
Let's consider the set of rules that are R. S uh, goes to A, S, A, or uh, B, S, B, or epsilon. So you should be able to get quick at producing certain strings, looking at a grammar and determining just by sampling a few strings it produces what the language should look like, right? What are the properties of the language? If you had to guess what this language, uh, let's give you guys a minute to think about this one. What would you guess that this grammar produces? Let's take a minute. Okay, basically what's going to happen is every time you add a every time you apply a production, it treats like the left and the right halves of the string, like a stack kind of, and so you 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 keep adding a's to the left every time you add an a to the right, and you keep adding b's to the left every time you add a b to the right, and it ma and every b matches an a, so this grammar actually produces exactly uh, the strings which have that symmetry. Draw the, the even palindromes. Right? Why? Well, let's see. Let's, let's, let's just do a couple. S goes to like ASA. And let's say we chose something else. We go to, I don't know, A, B, S, B, A. And then maybe we chose it again. Let's say A, B, B, S, B, B, A, right? And eventually we're going to delete the S when we apply the uh, other rule. So here, non-deterministically, the selection of production one or production two, which rule we apply, determines the string itself, uh, the palindrome itself. If it's going to be A, B, B, A, B, A, and so on, right? So here we apply, we can, we, we can do this repeatedly. And we produce uh, the strings that are exactly the strings, which are palindromes. All right. Now let's say we 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 also proved that the palindromes were non-regular, but we also we did it for the even length palindromes. How would I come up with a uh, uh, grammar for uh, the odd length palindromes? So let's say that'd be W sigma W R such that oh n is a natural. W is in uh, sigma star. <clears throat> so how would I come up, try and come up with a grammar that accepts, we gave a grammar for even palindromes. Try and come up with a grammar for odd palindromes. With the language being A's and B's? Yeah. Okay, so basically the point that makes this, the, well, what we can do is relate the first grammar to the second that we want to build. The first grammar, notice it always produces an even length strings because you always add two letters. Every time you do a production, you have to add two letters. And at the end, we just delete the thing. So, but we want to keep the part where it able, is able to produce uh, palindromes itself. It's able to split it, and it's, you know, it's able to match the uh, beginning of the string to the end of the string in this, in this way. So we'll keep that part, but then at the end we just delete it. If you think about an odd length palindrome, the middle character if an, in an odd string in an odd palindrome is always just going to be equal to itself. So it doesn't matter what the odd middle character is. So you can easily do this by just changing one rule. So we're going to go S goes to A, S, A, a B, S, B, or, and here instead of deleting the middle character, the A, you force there to be an A or a B. Now notice, again, 
productions, you have to keep applying productions until you don't have any uh, strings, right? Until you don't have any non-terminals left in your working string. So here, you would follow the same productions. But then here, instead of deleting the S, you are forced to insert in either an A or a B. And by doing so, you are forcing the length of the string to be odd. So this is a grammar for the odd palindromes. All right, let's see if you guys can come up with a grammar for uh, sigma star. There's actually uh, several grammars you could come up for this one. So sigma star, in some sense, is, not, is a language only by definition. There are no restrictions on it, no restrictions on the length of its element. There's no restrictions on the type of strings. It's quite literally, if it's a string, it's in sigma star. So you want a grammar that can produce all strings equally, right? So what would a grammar for this grammar for this look like? Yes. Is it just S to A S, S to B S, and then S to epsilon? Yeah. So it has to produce the empty string, uh, and it's going to be S goes to A S or uh, B S or epsilon. So convince yourself this grammar can produce every string. Why? Take some string. The string, the, the A's and the B's in the order of the string are quite literally the, the, the order you would apply the productions of this grammar to produce uh, that word. So that word would be produced by this grammar for any word, so this grammar should produce sigma star. I said there were equivalently many, so here's another one. It's a worse one. Right? So actually, uh, this, grammar, this grammar produces the strings one at a time, uh, produces the letters of the word one at a time. This one produces them in pairs. It produces every pair of letters. And then at the end, if it's odd, it's going to choose A or B for the last letter. And then if it's even, it's going to choose the epsilon. Right? So this grammar also produces uh, uh, sigma star. It just does it in a different way. And in fact, there's another way you could do this one. You could even do it kind of like the palindromes. You can think of this one as taking the language of the palindromes, but by adding this BSA and the A and ASB rule, what you're doing is unstructuring it. So the rules in the palindrome language force the A's and the A's and the B's and the B's to match up. But by adding these productions, you unstructure it, and you don't force that anymore. So now it can only produce any string, basically. This grammar produces sigma star. All right, so here's a, here's a challenging one. Can you guys give a grammar? Uh, well, let's do this one first. Can you give a grammar for the set containing the empty string? a warm up one actually what is a grammar for the set for the, what is a grammar that only produces the empty string is it just epsilon so like S yeah. transitions to epsilon is this going to be put here now here's another one let's see if you guys can do this one what is the grammar uh, for the empty set It's a little tricky, so gotcha. Let's see if you guys have an answer. Can you give a grammar for the empty set? A non-trivial grammar. So there always has to be one, let's suppose there's one, at least one non-terminal, right? The program exists. Can you just transition it to itself? Sure, that's one way, but there's another, there's, there's more ways, right? So we could do, uh, the one I like to do is S goes to uh, X, uh, And I walk over here, it's going to detect it. There we go. 
Okay, S goes to X, and then X goes to S, where X is some other non-terminal, right? We say a production halts. A production, you have to keep applying productions until it produces a string, okay? But this set of rules is just going to replace, okay, we're going to replace S with X. We only have one other rule. We were forced to replace X with S. We're back to where we, we began. So this set of productions, any time, if you attempted to have it produce any string, it couldn't produce anything, right? Any, any application of productions of this grammar is never going to stop. So this produces no strings, which is therefore the empty set. The other one, as you mentioned, is just as, is just as well. S goes to, S is a valid production rule, valid set of productions. You have one non-terminal on the left. You have a, a string of non-terminals and terminals on the right. That's, that works too. That also produces nothing. Yes? Is like never halting the same as producing nothing? So if it was like S transitions to AS, but that's the only transition, so it just... Yeah, so we say that a grammar produces a string only after a sequence of productions that there exists a working string which has no non-terminals in it. And if there exists, if, if there exists a production like an infinite sequence of productions that always has a non-terminal in it and it never stops, then that path should produce no strings. Uh, doesn't matter. If, there may be another path, though, that does produce a string, certainly. Right? So like a to AS, right, for the grammar, like AS, S goes to AS or epsilon. There exists, maybe you could infinitely apply this rule. We don't care about that. We care about the rules that stop. The, 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 we care about the, the sequence of productions which terminate. We don't care that there is maybe infinitely many ways you could, you could apply this infinitely many times. It doesn't matter because you would never stop there. We only care about the times you do stop, which is when you apply this 20 times and then eventually take this one time. Right? Okay. Any questions on, on the CFG so far? But for S transition to S, there is like a terminus state, right? Like there is uh, epsilon or... Like exactly. L. There is no epsilon. Exactly. Exactly. So this would be very different. Is this valid? Ah, yes. By the, you can have code that's syntactically correct, but useless, certainly. It may not be interesting. It's not interesting. Um, but you can, it's not illegal to have bad code. It's just interesting, like, what are the limits of things that are allowed? By the, by the definition we gave, production just has to have one non-terminal on the left. Uh, string on the right doesn't say that there has to even be any non-terminals or anything. Just can you can do that just fine. It's weird, but it's allowed, certainly. Okay. Um, so basically, again, the first half today, just going to do like a million examples of CFGs. Um, so here's an here's a, here's an interesting one. You maybe know this language by another name. S goes to A, S, B, or S, S, or epsilon. I'll give you guys a second uh, to think about that one. This one is actually non-trivial. But there's a human name for this language that you may have seen, you may recognize in some way. So let's think about what kind of, maybe write out a few strings of what it produces. Uh, think about this one. This one uh, a little challenging, but it's a famous. It's a it's a very famous example as well.
you guys want the answer? You guys have an, you have an answer? Let's see. Is it like the inverse? Like one side's the opposite of the other side? What do you mean the one side is, what does that mean? Like if you have an A on the first half, then you have a B in that same position in the second half. Or like, I think so, but there's a better, there's another way, actually. There's another way to describe, I think, that exact property, turns out. So I'll, I'll just tell you, I used A and B here as a distraction, okay? Suppose instead of A and B, I used, uh, open and close parentheses, right? So this is going to be S goes to open S close or SS or epsilon. Right, so this is going to produce like uh, open, 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 close, 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 but it'll also produce open, open, close, open, close, close. Right, so the name of this language is uh, uh, valid, balanced parentheses. This is, that is too long to say every time, so we call this the dick language. E-Y-C-K, it's named after some guy. It comes up all the time in like really obscure places. Like the number of valid strings of, uh, that it produces of length n is also, I think it's the Catalan numbers and so on. It, it's really, it pops up in surprising places. But maybe you can convince yourself that this is going to be uh, uh, the valid and balanced parentheses, right? So like as you said, every A is going to have a B, right? And the A's, every string has to start with an A, and it also has to end with a B, right? So it's going to be valid. Uh, you can't, you'll never have a string that it looks like this. That, that's not going to happen, right? Every A also has a B. So you also are not going to produce something like this, right? So, and it turns out you, all you need to emulate the structure of having something like this versus something like this is just having the rule SS. Turns out that's all you need for that. So this is the grammar. Uh, for the Dick language, very famous. Uh, okay, so let me give you. Um, I'm going to give you a language. I want to see if you guys can come up with a grammar for this one. So let um, L is going to be um, a to the n, b, a to the m, b to the n plus m. N and M are integers, or naturals, excuse me. All right, so let's see if we can come up with a context-free grammar for this one. Again, it seems hard, but like everything in this class, there's just one trick. Once you get the trick, the, it's, it wipes itself. is the same as like saying you take an E transition n times, right? Exactly. But the part, it's not A star necessarily because the N here has to match with this N here. Those two N's have to be the same. Great. Uh, let me tell you guys the answer. If we have strings of this form, a to the n, a to the m, a to the n, b, a to the m, b to the n plus m, um, if we were to write that out, we're going to have like a, 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 and this is going to occur n times, um, b, and then an a, 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 and that's going to occur m times. Um, 
b to the n plus m is actually equal to b to the m plus n. So you're going to have b, uh, b, b. We can call this part, this is going to be size m. And then we can have b, b, b. This is going to be size n. So if you think of it, if you view the string this way, recursively, you can break this up and solve it. Into, you can split it up. So you can, let's ignore this part for now. Right? We'll do that part later. I'll just draw this all the parentheses. We'll do that part later. But notice that we begin with a, a, n a's and end with n b's. So what I'm going to do is have s goes to a, S, B, and the number of times that I apply this rule should be N. Then I want to non-deterministically choose when to start producing the middle part. Right? The middle part is going to begin with a B, though. So I'm going to use a different letter. So just to separate it from S, so I don't want to go from S to something and then have something go back, maybe. I want to go to something totally different, like a different whole another function computation, right? So it's going to be like, I'm going to call this BR. Okay? And then R is going to go to uh, something as well. Well, notice that BR, this is that B. So this B is forced here, which is this B. And then we want A to the, we want MAs followed by MBs. So it's just going to be uh, AR. B or epsilon. You guys agree that this grammar produces this language? Not an interesting, interesting language, but it is a language that shows, uh, it demonstrates two things. One, you can still apply your, even though this is a weird and not deterministic thing, you can still apply programming ideas uh, that you have to building grammars in the sense that you have a different, you delegate this to a different branch or a different function or a different computation, and then you do it separately, and then you just compose them in a way that's nice. And uh, there is still non-determinism, though, because here n and m are both chosen non-deterministically as when you choose to do it. Also notice, when you ch ch take the second production to go to r, you can never come back to s. So you go to r, you've gone through in a way that you can't come back. So once you go to R, it's kind of like you're going S, like, something like that, mentally. So like there's a one-way, um, there's like mentally a one-way door uh, as if it was a transition and you can't come back to S, right? Because we defined it that way. There is no production from R that leads you to S in any way. Yes? Can you do this with only variable? Or? Maybe. I don't know. Would something like S to ASB or S to AB and then S transitions to B as like instead of epsilon, would that work? Say that one more time. So, so S transitions to ASB or S, A, B, or B. You might accidentally put too many Bs, right? Again here, notice that when we do this, we force this B to exist exactly one time. Right, that's why. So for example, if you had just the rules S goes to A, S, B, or epsilon and some other rules, if you have an epsilon going to your S, you can produce an empty string, and the empty string should not be in this language, because every string in this language contains at least one B. Yeah, so instead of epsilon, it's just B that it transitions to. So what's your grammar? Uh, S to A, S, B, or S, A, B, or B. Oh, because... No, that would not work because then you can do ABB. A, B, A, B. You can do A, B, A, B, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you need 10. Thank you. So sometimes it, it, it's safer to add more productions and do it simpler with one production. With, add more non-terminals to keep things separated than it is to maybe simplify it down. 
Okay. Um, let me do an example of kind of a complicated one. So I claim this is at least uh, so context-free grammars are at least slightly useful for parsing programming languages and parsing. Uh, you know, we'll talk a lot about this, like why it was developed and stuff, but. Um, it, it, when people were building programming languages, they realized they needed a way to parse. So a program, like a C program, is just a string. It happens to look like many strings because we use the new line character, but just pretend the new line character is just another symbol of the alphabet. You're, you're a computer program, you're trying to parse a C program into its parts. It turns out you need a theory of parsing, and that had not been developed yet. It was founded on context-free grammars. So I'm going to give you like a minimal grammar for arithmetic expressions. What is it? Let's say we go uh, an arithmetic expression, and again, this is a very simplified one. It's kind of like a valid calculator uh, string. So I'm going to say s goes to s or, or plus t, and t is for term, or term. Term is going to go to t times f or f, and then f is going to go back to s, or the number. And instead of doing 1 through 9, I'm just going to do the letter a. You should believe that I could perhaps replace a with a non-terminal whose only job is to produce strings which are digits, like 1 through 9, like 0 through 9, excuse me. So like I could replace this with another non-terminal, and that produces 13, 27, 333, three, you know, strings like that, right? So this is uh, a subset of a larger grammar. And all these programming languages do have grammars defined for them, for their parsing. They have a set of rules like this. Uh, this is a subset of the grammar of the rules that would produce something that looks valid on a calculator, right? Like your calculator would check your string looks like this and then before evaluating it, right? Before doing something crazy. And I claim... Um, that this grammar can produce, uh, I'll write it this way, S, we put a star over the uh, production to mean through a sequence of productions, through many productions. We use an arrow for one production. But we'll, I'll prove that it generates this following string, A plus A uh, times A. Right? So I'm just going to give you a very wordy example of, uh, of proving that this grammar does produce this string. And I think we should agree this is a valid calculator, valid string. Like, the calculator should accept that one, right? So another reason, by the way, if you ever tried accidentally doing it on a calculator where you, like, where you write 3x squared instead of, like, 3 uh, times x uh, squared or something, right? You need to put this asterisk there because of the parsing. Yeah. On the radio, like the left half is slightly cut off. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Okay, so um, right. So let's just do the let's just do the productions here. I'm gonna say s goes to. Um, I need the addition, and this is a long example, but I'm just working it out so we have something to do. Uh, s goes to s plus t. It's going to go like that. And then I'm going to say S should go to hmm. This is hard. I'll do it the other way first. I'll do the multiplication first. Wait, Professor, wouldn't there just be an infinite amount of S's in this because S Oh, I just choose not to take t. the s infinitely. Then oh my bad. Yeah. I can see the t. <laughs> then no. Right. So I'm going to go s goes to t. I'm going to speed run to the multiplication, and then t is going to go to t times f. And then f is going to go to a. So t times a. And then t is going to go to T is going to go to F 
times A. And then F is going to go to S times A. And then S is going to go to A plus A. So we're going to go uh, a T, excuse me, go to S plus T uh, times A, which is going to go to uh, T plus T times A, which is going to go to uh, F plus T times A, which is going to go to uh, F plus F uh, times A, which is going to go to A uh, plus F uh, times A, which is going to go to uh, A plus A uh, times A. So th through the example, hopefully I applied all the rules correctly, you, you can have very complicated grammars, and then the production is going to be quite complicated themselves. That's sort of the point of the example. Uh, the other thing is you maybe have noted, if you're doing this in your head, that you maybe have followed a different sequence of productions to find the same string. That's OK. It's not necessarily true that a grammar produces a string uniquely. A grammar can have more than one way to produce the same string. Right. So you could have, I chose to do uh, this f first to a, then this f, but I could have done it the other way, and some other things like that. Right. OK, I'll do two more examples. Uh, for us. So I'm going to do uh, palindromes, WWR, but uh, I want the number of ones in W to be one. So it's a palindrome, but it only contains a single one. What's the language? The alphabet is AB. That is the language there. Yeah. So it's zero and one this time. For no real reason, I cut it in A. Oh, both sides only contain one one. But they contain it in the same spot because it's a uh, palindrome. Right. This one is a kind of a devious one because it's it's. Uh, you may want to insert the one. You may just think, okay, I put everything zeros everywhere, zero star style. But then I put the one in somewhere. But you have to make sure that not only are there two ones in every string, uh, but that they are in the same position distance from the center or from the ends of the string. Right? So what you're gonna, actually going to do is do something like this. S is going to go to zero S zero. You freely, you happily apply as many zeros as you want. And then when you apply a one, it's time to get serious. This would not work. You could not apply, uh, if you do something like this, you can apply one many times. So we're going to replace this with an R. And the R means you can't come back. R is going to go to uh, 0, R, 0. Two arguments for correctness. One, uh, there's exactly one one, always applied. Uh, there's at least one one, and there's exactly one one. 
So at least one one because um, in order to get to your stopping condition, you have to go through R. So this production, any string that is produced by this grammar is forced to apply this rule at least once. So every string contains at least a one. And it contains exactly a one, because once you apply that one, there's no way to apply more than one one. So every string contains exactly those two ones, um, each half. And it does maintain the same symmetry we had for palindromes. Right? Every time you had a zero on the left or right, you had a zero on the left or right. OK. Um, uh, and here's a, here's a last example. Well, how much time do I have? Let me see. I got a minute. So I'll do uh, this is one more example. Uh, a to the 3n, uh, b to the i, uh, c to the n minus i. And of course, i is going to be less than or equal to n. So the trick here is that uh, n minus i plus i is just n. So you really have something here of size n. Bs and Cs are of size n. And over here, you have three n, a's. So what you want to do is for every b or c you add, you add three a's. So here's, a, here's one idea. So this is true that every time you add 3a, every time you add a b or a c, you do add 3a's. So you do preserve the 3n to the n relationship here, that linear relationship. But the problem is here is that you can add the b's and the c's out of order. So what you want to do is like force there to be a time where you stop applying c's and then you start applying b's. So you non-deterministically choose how many of the, these are n characters total. You just non-deterministically choose how many of them are going to be Bs and how many of them are going to be Cs. And at a point, you switch between applying those rules. So instead of this, um, it's going to be A, 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 S, C. You're applying three As for every C. And then eventually, you're going to switch modes. R is going to give you A, 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 um, a, 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 R, B, or Epsilon. Right. So we apply the Cs as many times as we want. We go through a one-way door. We come out the other side, still applying the same relation, but now we're only applying Bs as many times as we want uh, until, we, until, we want to, until we want to quit. Yes? Did you flip the B and C? Would it still work or no? Well, no. Actually, it wouldn't. Because we want the Cs to be at the end. Right. And the Bs to be in the middle. So the As, so another way to think of this is like, here's the, the As are on this side and the Cs are on that side. So these Cs have to match with like these As. Right. Right. So we want the Cs to be first if we're producing them. We're pr so if you think of a production like a context-free grammar, I like to think of like a flower. Like a, like a DFA goes digit by digit as if you're reading the string. You can't do that. You, this is unnatural for most people because you cannot read. A, there's no string to read. You just somehow non-deterministically wake up and you have the string in your hands. You produce it not literally left to right like you would expect on any program, but from the outside in. You're literally going in an order that's unnatural to us. Okay? And you're not even beginning with an input to read. You just somehow wake up and then the string is bloomed. 
like a flower. So you go think from the outside in, not deterministically. I'm just pasting in all these substrings, and somehow I end up with the answer, rather than I'm somehow parsing it in any way. You know. Okay, I have one final example for you, and it's probably my favorite uh, context-free grammar. W uh, x and hash is just some special symbol. X contains w r as a substring. So let's see if you guys can think of a grammar for this one. Give you guys another minute. This one's a hard one because it seems, uh, but the, uh, uh, the solution is beautiful. So give you guys a, a minute on that one. So hash is a part of the alphabet? Yeah. And it only appears one time. So let's say w and x don't contain any hashes. Right. Okay, so the idea is like, if x contains wr as a substring, then like w hash x looks like w hash sigma star wr sigma star, something like this. So, but here we can break things up kind of easily if you rewrite it like this. So if, again, x contains wr as a substring, Fix the substring and then choose the prefix and postfix, right? So what the grammar is going to look like is if we parenthesize this, it's going to look like that, right? That looks maybe more doable as a uh, context-free grammar. So let me first do sigma star. So let's say I have like t is going to go to a t b t or epsilon. So t produces sigma star. Then I can reference t wherever I want. So now I'm going to do S goes to uh, let's say RT where I want this to be T and I want this to be R. Okay, so now I can build R. R is going to go to um, W and WR, so it's going to be A, R, A, or B, R, B. And eventually, I want a stopping condition, which is going to be this middle part. So that's quite literally just going to be hash T. T produces sigma star. The reason I like this grammar so much is because this seems like a very difficult problem. Um, because you are deterministic and feeble and weak and a baby, right? So, like, you, this is a classic problem in any algorithms course, okay? Right? Like, you take a string, find a substring somehow. It's uh, somehow dynamic programming maybe in there. There's some searching going on. It's a complicated problem. I give you a string. I ask you to find the substring that matches this. Uh, find the longest... Longest palindromic subsequence is a dynamic programming algorithm, right? So that's not what this is, but it seems similar. So it seems like maybe there is some directions there that you require that kind of attack, something difficult in that sense. But the beauty here is, is, is that non-determinism non is such a superpower. We don't have to find the solution at all. What we do, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. You don't need to find a needle in a haystack, okay? That's what those algorithms do because they're deterministic. Non-deterministically place the needle and then choose the rest of the haystack around the needle, right? So congrats, you now have enumerated every object, every haystack that contains a needle, and you know it contains a needle because you put the needle there, right? This forces 
x to contain the substring. So you force the substring wr to be contained in x, and then you non-deterministically choose the rest of x around it. So you put the substring there and then build the rest of it around it. Just, you, uh, I'll put it there. Non-deterministically, very easy. Uh, deterministically, like an algorithm, it seems uh, non-trivial. It might be trivial, but it's, it's, it at least it seems like it might take an extra second to think about it. Okay. Uh, 